He's the century's most extraordinary person, said Jenny later to Illico. He'll bite my head off if some third secretary of mine in a branch office forgets to write sympathetically to a mountain mother in Tennessee and, her, and how he's got to know we will never find out. But if there's real trouble, he's as restful as a hot pillow. He's always been the same. Years ago, he'd keep a, Lin a Lindbergh waiting while he mooned about in the outer offices watching some wretched typist putting in a new ribbon and giving us all hell when she broke down and cried. Yet if one of us did make a really disastrous blunder, was there ever a row? There was not. He likes a crisis. It amuses him. Look at him now. He's built everything on your white Ben. White Ben disappears and... Funny fellow is all, but, is all that Bus says. Thus spake Jenny Oleron, who did not often discuss her employer. But her lover was away and Illico was an easy ally. She was having breakfast with him at ten o'clock at night, and she was having champagne with her eggs and bacon. Illico had never found her so human. He had not taken Je taken to Jenny at first, but then no one ever took to Jenny at first. She was an acquired taste, but now he found, as everyone found in time, that he had somehow acquired the taste. She was actually wanting to be friendly. He found that touching in the great Jenny Oleron. Nevertheless, he had an idea that she was losing her sense of proportion. Buss was not the century's most extraordinary person. The most extraordinary person of the century had disappeared. And I think, said Illico resentfully, that your employer is taking it a shade too calmly. Jenny only laughed. <laughs> do you remember, she said, that Charlie McCarthy craze about 16 years ago? I do, said Illico re resentfully. He thought he saw what was coming. Well, the first time Bus ever took me out, we saw Charlie McCarthy. I cried with laughter, but Bus was extremely serious. He told me he was giving me my first lesson in international politics. Did he? said Illico politely. Yes, he did. She stared at him. And I applied it to domestic politics, if you want to know. Which is my role, said he. Oh, I hope you're the ventriloquist. So does Bus. Because, if you remember, the day came when Bergen was forced to create a second Charlie. What was the creature's name? I forget. But Bus thinks you may have to create a second White Ben. Illico experienced a sudden pang of loyalty and was surprised by it. He was also aware that Jenny was watching him closely. Ben is unique, he said coldly. His disappearance is rather ungrateful, don't you think? So? She said she. If he didn't come back, it would certainly hold you all up. Oh, no, put that out of your mind. All would go forward according to plan, Buss's plan. If your white Ben never appeared again, things would still go forward. But what would you do? Go and look, go and look for him or work with us? She had pushed aside her plate and plumped her two elbows on the table. Her fists supported her small pointed chin. Her eyes were bright and expressionless. He fought her power by instantly attacking. Am I being hypnotized? Bus only wanted me to find out. I believe in Ben, he said slowly. You really do believe in him? What was he to say? His mind worked so furiously that he could feel the thoughts shuddering. Did he believe in Ben? He really believed in his own instinct. And his instinct had run after Ben, wagging its tail. Now the great Jenny Oleron was tempting him. Or was she testing him? Weigh it, Illico, weigh it. There will always be a job for me with Jenny, thought Illico, long after Arthur's smashed himself up quietly on some obscure flight in which no one's interested. There'll be a job for me with Jenny Oleron, but not leadership. I'll never lead Jenny as I might Ben. When Ben smashes himself up in his turn, in time I'll be left sole leader, sole heir of Ben's success, if Ben succeeds, but if Ben fails... It's a gamble, but if Ben fails first, there'll be no running back to Bus and Jenny Oleron. If Ben fails, and I end as I began, cooking stew in a chalk pit, it's folly to back Ben when I can have security. On the other hand, on the other hand, slowly knowing that Jenny watched him, he felt in his pocket and pulled out one of the chocolate half-crowns which he had found in Ben's pocket. Slowly he poised it between his finger and thumb. 
Paul, he said to Jenny, her eyes lit. This sort of thing she enjoyed. Tails, said Jenny. He spun it. Tails it is, said Illico, picking it up. So I back Ben. Cheat, said Jenny, amused and picked. Not at all. I meant. Yes, I didn't. I back Ben. Do you stay with us for the present, asked Jenny meekly, taking up the chocolate half-crown and peeling off the silver paper. As his representative, yes. I'll tell Bus, said Jenny, nibbling the chocolate. He'll turn up, you know, said Illico, tomorrow or the next day. Arthur says, said Jenny, that he put in a call before he disappeared. Where to? He was trying to get Bessie Pont. A wave of relief broke over Illico's head. The tenseness left him. He relaxed. He reposed in his chair. He had, st he had staked and he had won. Poor little Jenny. Don't you see, he said kindly, that there's nothing whatever to worry about. Ben was probably bored by Arthur Latimer. Ben always quits when he's bored. We shall find him when we get to London. He's gone to stay with Lady Pont. And that is the end of chapter 28.